Hi everyone, I'm Ann Vu, a technical product manager on the Exchange team. In June, I went to TechEd North America, where I got to talk to a lot of customers, partners, and wonderful people about what they loved about Exchange, as well as get some questions for Geek Out with Perry. So recently, I sat down with Perry Clark, who's a general manager on the Exchange team, and a special guest, Matt Gossage, to get some of the answers to the questions that you ask. Hey Perry, I got a question. My name is Martin Tuop and I'm actually involved in archiving and I've been involved in archiving for a long time. When you think about preserving content, it's just not about three or five years. How do you see Exchange keep content for 25 or 50 years? Perry, where do you see the preservation of email going? We think it would be a colossal waste for somebody to design a system that's going to store all their content that they're going to need for the next 50 years. Right, and build out a piece of infrastructure and get it deployed right now. You'd be wasting a huge amount of money because you'd never fill it up. The hardware would wear out before it filled up. When you really think about it, it really has to come down to you're building a long-term process um, that uh, allows you to deal with the expected situation as, uh, as time evolves. So I think one of the things you're going to have to do is uh, look for vendors that are going to have a long-term tra track record. Um, have got very clear covenants with customers about being able to get to their data and get it out. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, really, we have to take advantage of the, um, uh, uh, the trends in the industry. Disk drives are getting bigger and bigger. They're already, in many cases, way cheaper than any other storage system we've got. Uh, and they keep getting bigger really faster than the amount of data that people uh, are generating. Right? Uh, over the last few years, the amount of mail that people have been keeping in their mailboxes has been growing pretty uh, particularly fast. But it's mostly because they've been extending the period of time they're retaining their mail. Mm -hmm. Percentage-wise, that effect is going to slow down a little bit as people get to five years. Adding an extra year is a much smaller change than going from one year to three years. Um, so uh, uh, our perspective is, uh, and we build a, ser a service and we build on-premise software to do this, is you build a, uh, a system in which you retain your email and on a regular basis you refresh the storage systems on it by moving to the dramatically cheaper hardware that becomes available. And you create a process that constantly does that so your data is always accessible by the latest tools. Um, uh, if you look at the history of standards, there's been no standards that have lasted for 50 years. There's been no pieces of hardware that have lasted for 50 years. There's been no, uh, um, there have been a few companies that have lasted 50 years, IBM, um, National Cash Register, um, but a very small per percentage of the, uh, um, of any uh, technology industry has, 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 has lasted that, that kind of time frame. So you do need to think about this as being a constant state of refresh and uh, having your system built around that. We think that our migration story and our ability to take advantage of the, the hardware as it comes along and do that ongoing plan refresh is, is the core of the strategy. Buying our service allows, us, allows you not to have to worry about it. It's just a part of it, uh, of it ongoing. And also making sure you have vendors that are around for the long haul. Think about it from the you know, perspective of decades and also have strong covenants about making sure you have access to the data at any time. Uh, if you need to, uh, uh, if your circumstances change dramatically. Hi, my name's Eamon Merchant, I'm the Technical Director of Career Consulting, and uh, I've got a question for Perry. Uh, can you please tell us uh, what's best practice for a dull tone recovery for an exchange database? Perry, what are the best practices for downtime recovery of exchange databases? Well, the first best practice is to buy our service and have us take care, for you, take care of it for you. Um, but if you really want to get some more detail, Matt Gossage is uh, the world's expert on uh, building exchange for HA and uh, telling customers how to do it. So um, why don't we ask him? Good question, Perry. Uh, the first best practice is to avoid having to actually do recovery of any type. And that is primarily based on using the technologies we built in 2010 to keep you from having to do a, a downtime recovery. Primary technologies there, of course, are database availability groups, keeping multiple copies of your data online at all times. So if one copy fails, you can fail over to, to another copy. Uh, potentially uh, add site resiliency, site resiliency to that. So if, if the data center goes down, you have your data in another data center. Uh, other features which are really, really important to enable are single item recovery. So if someone goes and deletes an item and actually purges their dumpster in Outlook, you don't have to go to backup to recover that item, but the administrator can do it uh, with a simple PowerShell command. 
So the, the primary best practice for recovery for exchange data is use our features so you never actually have to do it. You don't have to go and actually do a, a database restore from backup to actually recover your data because the features that we've built allow you not to have to do that. One of the questions that comes up all the time for us is the relationship between a DAG and clustering. So we want to really see whether you can explain to us more about that relationship of how the DAGs depend on clustering and what's needed in that, that area. So a DAG, or a database availability group, is built on top of a Windows cluster. Uh, we use cluster for just a few things. The primary thing is to make sure that we only have one copy of our database active at any given time, that there's quorum within the cluster, and that there is arbitration in choosing which database becomes active. It's a very, very bad thing when you have two databases active at the same time. You can have messages going to either one. That situation is called split brain. And the cluster technology allows us to prevent that from happening by um, ensuring that there is quorum. And so one person chooses which guy is active and which guy is not. In Exchange 2010, that guy is called the active manager, or primary active manager. And he actually follows the, the cluster group as it goes throughout the DAG. And that is the way we ensure that we uh, prevent the scenarios of split brain where two databases are active at the same time. Awesome. We're having some problems with people understanding the concept of uh, majority node set. What does that really mean and how does that work? So what are majority nodes? So majority node set is very much related to the last question. It's, it's, a, it's a resource concept of defining what defines a quorum within a cluster. So having uh, a majority allows the, the quorum to come up and allows us to make decisions on uh, activating databases. Uh, majority node set is based on each node having a vote uh, during the arbitration and quorum process. And you can also have a file share witness, which can also act as a vote. And the majority node set is, is the quorum model where uh, each of the nodes and file share witnesses get a vote. And you have to have a majority to actually form a quorum. Mm -hmm. So majority means you know, more than half. So as we talked about in the previous question, if you only have half, then you have not a majority and potentially have risks for split brain. So the cluster will not form unless there's actually more than half. And the uh, majority node set uh, allows that to, uh, to work that way. I'm uh, new to Exchange 2010. We have an Exchange 2007 uh, environment. And uh, basically, I want to know uh, how the best way is to set up a geo site um, with, with uh, multiple DAGs in kind of a small environment that's basically about 5,000 users. Okay, it's hard to make a recommendation based on very, very high level requirements such as that, but this is kind of the high level uh, perspective on it. Uh, with 5,000 users, you could probably get away with only having one DAG, mm -hmm. save yourself a little capital cost by not deploying the additional hardware. You can stretch that DAG across two sites, have potentially two nodes in one site, two nodes in another site, four co total copies of your data, mm -hmm. two in each site, so you can handle the, the storage failure cases uh, during uh, during site resiliency uh, events. Uh, you can have a file share witness in one site, kind of use that site as your primary. And then you use DAC mode for uh, data center activation uh, if the primary site fails and you have to activate the secondary site. Uh, there's lots of other uh, types of site resiliency solutions that you can build with the capabilities in Exchange 2010. This is just a very simple example. Hi Perry, my name is Matt Walters and I'm a Windows Server admin currently doing a Link 2010 deployment and I was kind of curious what will Exchange 2010 do for us that Exchange 2007 does not? So what does Exchange 2010 give you that Exchange 2007 doesn't? So this is kind of like my top list for uh, top five reasons for upgrading? Yeah. Okay, well, uh, and my personal recommendation? Yeah, why not? Okay. So when I think about uh, making a personal recommendation, I'm really going to go back and think about all the things that uh, really made a difference to my life, personally. And I can think of a few. Um, one of them was uh, actually the introduction of uh, voicemail into my inbox with 2007, but 2010, adding in the, the uh, ability to turn it into actual text in my inbox was a huge change and personally affected me. My wife was uh, pregnant at the time, and uh, it was quite a huge relief to be able to sit in a meeting uh, and see that my wife had phoned me. 
and be able to distinguish between, um, honey, could you pick up some milk on, uh, when you come home from, you need to come home right now uh, and do that quietly without getting up and, and, and uh, so on. And it was a big uh, sense of peace of mind for my wife at, at the time. So um, uh, another big uh, game changer for me from a productivity perspective was conversations uh, in OA in particular and uh, Ignore Conversation. Uh, which is a very fun tool for reducing the uh, amount of unneeded uh, distractions in your inbox. Um, but you know, my heart and soul has to be in the uh, plumbing work that we did in 2010. So, uh, um, uh, and there, you know, I also feel some personal benefits from the things we did. You know, personally responsible for the quality of the service we run. Uh, so our, our back efforts dramatically reduce the, the risks associated with uh, 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 having a very small set of people who are very well vetted, who have access to um, uh, data, um, access to um, uh, tools that uh, could cause a lot of damage when they're, when they're using them to run the system. So uh, being able to control that very effectively and know exactly who's got access uh, and make sure those people are strongly vetted is a huge peace of mind for me when I go home at the end of the day. So um, it's my personal recommendation for people for who are upgrading on-premise uh, based on um, my experience and how it made my life better. So customers can enjoy this too. Absolutely. Thanks for watching this very special edition of Geek Out with Perry. And thanks to Perry and Matt for sitting down with me to answer those questions that everyone's been asking. Look for me at other conferences to ask Perry a question and check out his blog and other episodes of Geek Out with Perry. Thanks.